All right. I think it's game time. Is it on? Yes. Be awesome. Hi, everybody. And hi, everybody who's um, watching from the comfort of their dorm room. Thanks very much for coming out on a Monday night. We have an amazing, amazing event planned for you guys. I am Sylvia Maxfield, Dean of the Business School. And on behalf of Delta Sigma Pi, which is a business school club, many of you, I think, are here because you're members of DSE and Providence College, I wanted to welcome you to tonight's sports industry panel. And I'm particularly excited about this tonight because secret that you're hearing for the first time as students tonight, we are thinking about starting a master's of science in sports and innovation. So that is something I've heard from students over the years. There won't be an undergraduate minor or major, but it'll be a graduate option. It's something I've heard from students for years that they're interested in, and um, we're starting to think about it very seriously. So I'm really excited to have a panel about the sports industry to help us along the way as we think about that. We have an amazing moderator tonight, Sean Hawley, Sean Wade. He's a member of our faculty. Um, some of you may be in his class right now. He graduated in 1984 from PC, and he studied economics. He was an MLK scholar. He's had a distinguished career in the sports and entertainment industry. He worked with the Big East uh, and leading sports and entertainment agencies. He's been a sports agent and has represented some of the biggest names in sports. And he's now the administrator for the state of Rhode Island's Equal Opportunity Office. So join me in welcoming Sean. And our first panelist um, gives me tremendous pleasure uh, to introduce a woman leader in the sports industry, Sarah McKenna. She currently serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Experience Officer for the Boston Red Sox. How many of you are Sox fans? Bring it on. When I was first, uh, my first year as Dean, for some silly reason, I assumed that this would be Red Sox territory. And I started working, walking across campus my first fall and I saw all these Yankees caps and I was like, wait, am I in the wrong place? But we have a very divided community here between the Red Sox and, um, and the Yankees. Sarah has spent the last 21 years in the Red Sox organization and is widely recognized for many accomplishments, including six Emmys. And she's a trailblazer when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts in sports. She spearheaded Take the Lead, a first-of-its-kind alliance between Boston's six major professional sports teams that is designed to combat racism in and around sports. She's a member of the PC Class of 96, where she earned a degree in healthcare policy and management. So please join me in welcoming Sarah. Our second panelist is the newly appointed president of NBC Sports, Rick Cordella. Rick is a graduate of the class of 99, and he majored in business management. He's had a remarkable career at NBC Sports and Peacock, which is NBC's streaming platform. He was a member of the founding team at Peacock, serving as executive vice president. And prior to Peacock, he spent a decade in roles with NBC Sports Group. In his current role as president of NBC Sports, Rick oversees all aspects of NBC Sports' collection of brands and platforms, which includes NBC Sports, I have to, it's a long list, um, NBC Olympics, the Golf Channel, NBC Sports Digital, and two transactional sports businesses, Golf Now and Sports Engine. And I signed him up to make sure that we get the best possible deal with Big East when we renegotiate our. We're gonna close it after this, after yeah, this right? Yeah, you're gonna close the deal. That'd be great. Um, so please join me once again in a very warm welcome to Sean, Sarah, and Rick. Good evening, everyone. First of all, uh, thank you, Sylvia, for that kind those kind introductions. Uh, but. I, I want to bring to the table the greatness of uh, the Providence College um, involvement in the sports industry. Many of you probably are aware of this, the uh, greatness as far as the student athletes that have gone on to play in the NBA, NHL, um, great names that have played in that. But I think now 
we're starting to see, not starting to see, we are, we have seen greatness as far as in the main office. We've seen greatness as it relates to uh, Rick and Sarah, you know, being executives in the sport industry. So Providence College, which many people think is a small school here in, in Rhode Island, Definitely has put sports on the map in a in a lot of different ways, and it uh, definitely pleases my heart to hear that there's talk of uh, a uh, a program, a curriculum, in sports management. So let's uh, get right into it. Um, welcome, Rick and Sarah. Uh, why don't we start out with uh, to begin? Uh, you're both PC graduates and students. We um, and as students. They're thinking about what planning to do after graduation or for graduation. As a PC grad, are the jobs that you're in now the same that you had in mind and envisioned when you while you were in school? And if not, what changed that trajectory? Um, I'm going to be honest. Uh, no, I I had my degree as um, you were told, just healthcare policy and management. And um, I had no clue, absolutely, at all what I wanted to do. Um, I just knew that I was looking for some sort of adventure after college. And so I went with some friends from PC, a um, couple of girls that I graduated with, and we drove cross country and ended up living in Oregon. And I took a job for a minor league baseball team there. And uh, that has grown into different baseball teams and a brief stint in the golf industry, but um, for the most part, uh, I did not know at that time. I do think it's okay not to know at the age of 20 or 21 or 22 what you want to do or what your life's goals are, have your path uh, completely figured out. I think there's something quite beautiful about the where the road takes you and the adventures that you can have. Absolutely. And I often talk to my students about... Um what are their career plans and even some that are seniors don't necessarily know or have that crystallized just yet. But Rick, if you can weigh in on this too as well. Sure. I, I mean, just like all of you, I, I graduated from Providence and I had no idea what I wanted to do. There were recruiters on campus for various jobs. I had minored in computer science and 1999 when I graduated, the dot-com boom is booming and they offered more money than another job. And I said, okay, I'll give this a try. And so I wrote code. Um, for our human resource consulting company, taking open enrollment where you do your medical and dental benefits offline with pen and paper and put it online. And I knew very quickly it just wasn't for me. It wasn't my personality. It wasn't, you know, put headphones on and just sit in front of a keyboard all day. And so I knew I had to get out of it. Um, I went to grad school. And while I was in grad school, I was hugely into fantasy sports, like just fleecing my friends on fantasy sports trades. I spent an inordinate amount of time trying to figure that out. And so I wrote into this small little website called rotoworld.com, which was owned by this other small business called All Star Stats, and said, I'll work for free. And so that was my entryway into sports. And I had a passion for sports, obviously, you know, being at Providence and playing, but also just loving Boston sports overall. And so I worked for zero dollars while I was in school. And that led to a minimum wage job, uh, which led to after graduating, my my mother and my girlfriend is now my wife of almost 20 years said, get a real job. You have your MBA. And instead I went to that same small company and asked, you know, would they hire me? And they hired me for programming, the very thing I was running away from, but I was working in sports. So I got my foot in the door that way and uh, worked for there for a few years. NBC ended up reacquiring NFL rights and we're relaunching their uh, NBC sports digital strategy. And they somehow got connected with us and, and they acquired our company. And I thought I had my dream job when I was working for NBC Sports, running digital media and, you know, never had any ambitions to be where I am today. But that's how I how I got in. OK, let's go back still a little bit with your during your PC journey. Can you point to anything during your time period at PC that may have catapulted you into where you are now? I think it's a lot of it. It's not only the education. I mean, I take the same business classes that you are all taking and you're going to be educated and be understanding of the various uh, disciplines within business. But I think it's the person. It's the emotional intelligence that you gain, the values. I remember Tim Russert, uh, the late Tim Russert, speaking at our, our graduation about family values, you know, how you treat people. And all that, I think, really plays into how you get from entry level and how you get to the top is how you care for your employees, how you lead them through 
I think a lot of those values I got, whether it was playing basketball at Providence and looking at the team and look, you know, luck on, you need a certain amount of humility. You know, you're running the same wind sprints as everyone else and you're not getting quite the playing time. Uh, so that's a part of it too. But I think it's, it's, the, it's the whole person. It's not just the education up here. It's the community. It's how you sort of, you know, help your friends and family and you bring it all to your career and, and it helps you, you know, as you sort of take the ladder up. Um, I think it's a little bit different for me because I went so far away from my major, shall I say, with um, healthcare policy and management. But um, what I will say is, is that this was a very comfortable space. Um, I was allowed to be myself. I was allowed to um, make great friends. And honestly, like met a lot of people. I tried to be friends with, you know, everybody that, that I met and um, largely my roles that I have had through my career in sports have been government relations. Um, and now it's just leading to where I am right now with the title of experience. And so <clears throat> it's a little like running um, we, Fenway Park. They say it's America's most beloved ballpark. But it's really also America's most beloved bar, right? So you've got to think about what is the perfect place that you want to be with all of your friends and what do you want it to feel like and what do you want it to sound like? And um, I think just honestly getting to know people in the social aspect here um, played a huge role in actually who I am and, and what I've become. Now, both of you have uh, achieved um, the great um, accolades already in your careers. Um, Care to share with us any career um, awards or accolades that are most memorable to you so far? Not about the awards so much, it's just those those achievements in sports. I think we're lucky to work on seasons. There's like a finality to it. When I worked on the Olympics in London and the first Olympics that we streamed, you know, at basically every event, and it was hard. We had some buffering issues. We had some things crashing. We had a few negative articles in the press. But we stayed on it. The team stayed on it. And we got to the end and we delivered on our advertising commitments. We had the most streamed Olympics of all time. And it felt really a sense of accomplishment at the end of that. Um, it happens after Super Bowls. It happens after other big events. And, you know, doing it as a team and getting to the finish line has always been, you know, really, you know, a great sort of feeling at the end of the day. There. Um, yeah, there's not. Um, I'd say there's different accomplishments at different phases of my career. But um, I think one that is particularly visual that is easy for me to see is um, shortly after I left Oregon, I went to San Diego and um, worked for the San Diego Padres and started with them on uh, the campaign to build a new ballpark there and oversee 26 blocks of redevelopment. And so it was a campaign and then stayed on for government relations to work on about 15 subsequent votes with the Port Authority and the city of San Diego. Um, selling municipal bonds and getting people to vote favorably for those. And so the whole ballpark district um, and the ballpark there is absolutely gorgeous. It's been paid for with tourist tax, tourist tax dollars. And um, it's just this remarkable area of San Diego. San Diego used to look a lot different um, in the downtown area. And uh, now it's, it's just a beautiful ballpark with a lot of hotels and an expanded convention center and, and so that's a very visual accomplishment for me, um, was to have worked um, so much on that. Cheryl, let's stay with you on this. Um, you've had a, a few different uh, teams that you've worked with. Can you share with us um, the differences from work, working with Portland to San Diego to Boston? Um, well, Portland was different just because it's minor league baseball. And, and actually, you know, you do a little bit of everything when you work in minor league sports. You sell tickets, you sell sponsorships, you do game entertainment. You have to dress up as the raccoon if no one can, you know, as the mascot if no one can make it. Um, so you do everything. So when I first moved to San Diego, um, it was uh, because I was getting married and my husband um, was taking a job. And so I actually had been offered a job with San Diego Padres and turned it down because in my mind, I was like, I don't want to pull the tarp anymore and do all this stuff. And I didn't fully comprehend the difference between minor league baseball and major league baseball. I went to work for a company called American Golf and um, sold tournaments and learned very quickly that I never want to sell. I, I don't want to sell in that way um, anymore. Um, and so to me, um, 
the campaign was starting up in San Diego to build this ballpark and they actually called me back. And so my boss there was a gentleman named Larry Latino. And when we came back, um, when the Red Sox were sold, I came back when the team was sold because I had been working for him for quite some time. So there, while there was a geographic difference and there was a passion in the fan base difference and there was a um, overall revenue stream difference, uh, the manner in which I worked and the people in which I worked for was not very different. It was actually quite comfortable. And you, you talked, you poked a little bit at the working with the minor league, but I often tell the students that that's a great opportunity. If you want to get into yeah. baseball in particular, or actually any, any position in, in the sports industry to work for a minor league team gives you an opportunity to, have your hands on a lot of different aspects. You learn a lot about what you like and you learn a lot about what you don't like, which is just as important um, because you have to like what you do in order to be successful at it, I believe. so. Rick, you've had a number of different uh, leadership roles. Uh, can you share with us which roles you feel have been most meaningful or can you attribute any of those leadership roles also back to your PC experience? Yeah, I, I think, you know, starting Peacock, I think one of the first employees of Peacock, which is kind of a starter within this multi-billion dollar company, was fascinating and coming into work and not knowing exactly what we were planning to do and how we planned to do it. And just, you know, that was a, a, a absolute blast. Um, you know, way back to my ro Rotor World days, too, when we first started there, is kind of like idea of the day, like, what are we working on today? How are we building this business? And uh, to Sarah's point, like when you when you start, and I would call that my minor league, I guess, you do a lot of different hats. And you're running the marketing team, you're running the, the you're writing code, you're writing you know content. Um, you're you know you're sort of in charge of the entire business. You learn a lot there. Um, in terms of back to my PC days, I mean, I, again, it, it goes back to you know the walk on days that so you're still working your tail off, not for you know the money because the money isn't big when you're first starting out. And so, again, you got to understand the hard work isn't being paid off immediately. It's a long term investment yourself. What, what can you point to that may help the students understand, uh, can help one move up the ladder, so to speak, as you've done? I think taking career risk. There's so many people that are super smart. They sit in their cubes every day and they don't understand why they're not being promoted. And I think at the end of the day, you have to sort of stick your neck out there and take a little bit of hey, I have an idea, and here's, here's why I believe in an idea. And I think when I look back of, of how I got to where I am today, a lot of that's the same thing, you know, whether it's taking the job in Rotor World in the first place when I have, you know, influential people in my life saying that's the wrong thing to do. I did it because I was passionate about it, and I felt like, hey, if I'm wrong, I'm going to be a year or two off from my peer set, and I'll go get that job in the financial industry or whatever it may be. It's hiring this guy. His name is Mike Florio. He was a pro football talk. You may be familiar with him. He's on Sunday Night Football now still. He was a, he was a lawyer in West Virginia that wrote blog posts in the morning, which I thought was pretty snarky. He was funny. He probably crossed lines that NBC Sports wouldn't be comfortable with. But I felt like it was a risk that was worth taking for us to kind of be differentiated in the space. Um, there were times with you know you got into FanDuel, which is a sports gaming company. Um, before they were in Daily Fantasy, and I had known the, the CEO there, and I felt it was probably a good shot that we should invest early on before any other media company did. And we invested ten million dollars when it was valued at maybe fifty to hundred million dollars, and I get to sit on the board for four years, and we end up getting paid out half a billion in terms of when we when I was sold. But each one of those moments, it was a calculated risk of my career saying, hey, there's a chance I'm wrong, but I feel like I'm going to be right. And I had the data to back it up, and I stuck my neck out there. I went to my boss and said, with conviction, I believe in this. And, you know, in success, it helped you kind of, it helps your profile, it helps you be exposed. And when jobs opened up, here's a guy that, you know, helped us sort of get there. So I think that's probably what I would advise is just don't worry about, you know, again, it's so easy to sit there and just do nine to five every day and hope that someone notices you. It's another thing to really understand your craft, understand whatever your job is to be the expert at that and how to do it better and raise that to your boss and, and get noticed for it. Can you raise your hand if you're a student athlete in the crowd here? Great. I, um, as Sylvia mentioned at the top, I'm, I've represented uh, professional athletes, and I'm a strong advocate for athletes and student athletes in, in general. What can you share with us uh, 
your experience as being a student athlete, how was that important to you in life? I mean, time management, first and foremost, and your, your schedule is, you know, I used to wonder what my friends did from 3 to 7 p.m. every day and, you know, maybe waking up to do sprints in the morning or lifting weights. Um, it's hard. As you get older, and, and maybe not early in your career, but now I have five kids. So, you know, I'm an Uber driver when I'm not working at NBC Sports, driving around town. But just planning out the week, you know, what are the, how, what's happening in the morning? Who needs to get to school or some other early morning activity? Who needs to be picked up from X, Y, Z activity in the evening? Where am I traveling? What am I doing? And just organizing your life is so important. And uh, again, I take that back to the PC days where like I knew I had to get my homework done at certain times. I knew I had to study at certain times. I had to be here at certain times. I think that sort of helped me because I was not, I'm not an organized person in general. Um, so I think I sort of learned that trait here. Sarah, DEI is something that's very important to me and important to a lot of people. Um, I would love to hear more about the program that you've implemented at uh, with the Red Sox. Um, so um, uh, sort of equity inclusion um, is something that I've cared about for a long time. I was just sort of raised that way. Um, my father had been part of a team desegregating schools in the South um, back in the 60s and um, said and had tried to kill him there while he was trying to uh, work down in Valdosta, Georgia, and um, thankfully was unsuccessful. So it was just sort of a mindset that which we all grew up with. And I think it's real easy when you're in an environment like ours um, that you can think everything's going great because maybe the team's winning or maybe good things are happening or anyone can go from there. The Red Sox um, obviously um, have a history that uh, when you buy a team, you buy their, you know, assets as well as their liabilities, right? And so um, purchasing that reputation um, of being a racist organization was something that we were very conscious of. Um, but we also know that it really matters how you act to people. And it's not just how you act to your fans, it's how you act to your employees, it's how you act to the players, it's how you act to your visitors, and the type of environment that you are willing to create. Um, social justice, um, inclusion, making everybody feel welcome, I think sometimes gets convoluted with people thinking that you're political and doing things like that. And so the mindset that I always bring to it is, and I tell everybody that that works with us, is that um, we're not going to be political. We're just going to be right. It is 100% right to make sure everybody feels welcome. It's 100% right to say Black Lives Matter. It's 100% right to say that we support our police that are out on the streets. It's 100% right to support our veterans. It's all those sorts of things. We come from an imperfect society. So in all of these communities, there's going to be 99% wonderful people, and then we're not going to focus on on the detractors. We're going to celebrate everybody's differences and we're going to make everybody feel welcome. One of the things as part of that process uh, was um, we heard from players. We've had some very public incidents where um, racial slurs have been used um, to some of our visitors um, and to some of our, our own players. And um, when we dug a little bit deeper, what we realized, particularly from our staff and in particular our game day staff, was is that they were falling victim to those things as well. And so we took it upon ourselves to go on sort of an exploration, sort of a healing, sort of a just a desire to be better and really listen to people and hear about their experiences. So we have implemented things like lifetime bans at the ballpark and gone from there. As part of that, we have really good relationships with all the other teams. We have a good relationship with the Bruins, the Patriots, the Celtics. Um, the revolution, um, at the time it was the pride, the women's hockey team. Um, but, and we sort of said to them, you know, all of our staff that's working here, the young people or the teacher that has a second job or the retired individual that is trying to work um, and just make a few extra dollars in the winter, they all go work at your place or they go work somewhere else. And if this is happening to them at our place, it might be happening there too. And so, we had this sort of, we had a lot of meetings and we talked about it and we talked about controlling what we can control and what we can really control is our own space. 
we can't control what happens a mile down the street on the corner, but we can control what happens in our own buildings and go from there. So we've all sort of taken a stance where in a unified way, we've had public service announcements, things like that, that play in the ballpark and play in all the other venues. It's the same one. And it plays before and during each game. Um, that says, basically, if you hear something, speak up so that we can we can deal with it. Uh, in addition to that, we collaborate on job fair um, so that we can do hirings. And we fund a, um, a uh, fellowship where one individual gets to work for all the teams in town over the course of a year and spend a certain amount of months with each one of us. And so it's a step in the right direction. Is it enough? Probably not because we still see these things that happen. I'm, I'm always fascinated by people that say, oh, that doesn't happen. And I'm like, how do you even know? You're not there. You're not with us, you know? And, and, um, and so I think we're just constantly trying to be better, but there's other nuanced little changes that um, I don't even know if people notice. I bet more young people notice, um, you know, I made a change with our DJ. Um, just something as simple as that, because we were having real conversations about, I would really like you to play different music. I'd like you to play more Latin music. I'd like you to play more K-pop. I'd like you to do more of this. I'd like you to do more of that. And our venue is a little bit, you know, you get people that have been there for a long time and people can be a little bit stubborn and say, oh, this is how we do it. And this is this, and this is that. And I say, oh, the, the face is changing. Like the face is changing of Boston. The face is changing of New England. And by the way, that's a great thing. And so we've implemented all these heritage nights. Um, we've gotten new DJs that bring different music to the venue. And we're actually seeing attendance growth out of all those demographics. That is, that's real. It's, it's real. And we're reaching new people and we're reaching new first time buyers. And in my role, it's not only the responsibility to create a first time buyer, but my job largely falls on making someone a second time buyer, which is, we have a lot of people that can get you into the building once, but it's on the rest of us to make sure that you want to come back again. So I don't know if I answered your question. But... Oh, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's tremendous um, information. I uh, One of the roles that I have with the state is that I train every uh, state employee for racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. What type do you guys do any type of training or anything of like that? We do do a lot of training and a lot of it has been designed um, actually on our own because we found a lot of people would come in and you'd, just hold up the fair foul card and you do this and you do that. Um, but we found that we learned a lot more in particular from our supervisors um, that um, work in different areas and they just shared with us their stories and gave us real advice on how to handle things. Um, and most importantly, how to treat them and how to respond to them when something bad happens. Um, because we are, we're at a busy place. There's alcohol involved. Like, Things happen. People get upset. You put 40,000 people in a room together. Someone's about to be in a bad mood. You can't guarantee that all of them are, are going to be the best behaved people. But um, we worked with, um, I don't know if you might remember, but do you remember Liz Walker that was on TV? The, yes. So yeah. she's now a reverend. She's gone to divinity school at Harvard. So she's the reverend Liz Walker. And she is particularly um, skilled and she is trained in trauma training. And so what she has done is she's brought us all together and she runs these sessions where everybody sort of speaks honestly. And then we couple that with other organizations that we've worked with on tools and skills, whether it's de-escalation or it's just changing your vernacular or just being more mindful of what you see and what's going on with you. But what I found to be the most impactful is, is when you hear that your coworker says, um, you know, this happened to me. Someone called me this this slur and then you hear from their counterpart that their best friend um and they say yeah and i didn't have anything that i could do about it so just by giving them the opportunity to work with us to leaven it you know put a ban or do something like that it's um it's been pretty powerful just because people feel more heard that's the first step now sports is extremely powerful i think sports breaks all barriers um uh, in Civ, we learn, we talk about the difference between too much play and not enough play. Uh, Rick, what, how do you feel um, inclus inclusiveness, diversity, any of that? How do you feel that that's 
been um, experience for you through your sports? Sure. Uh, well, first off, the NBC Sports, I think we have two ways of looking at it. One is diversity in terms of hiring, representation with our employee groups. Um, so we certainly have a diverse slate. We recruit at historically black colleges and universities uh, to try and grow the pipeline because it is hard in sports. It tends not to be as, as it tends to be more homogenous than we probably want it to be. Um, we also have in front of the camera, uh, we try and make it a priority too, to have diversity of, of, you know, talent that's there. I think we've done a pretty good job on that. And then it gets into the content, like what content we put on our airways. And so, you know, we have the Bayou Classic every every fall. Uh, we work closely with Notre Dame for a game against Tennessee State uh, earlier this year. Um, obviously, uh, in terms of women's sports, women's sports is on a, a growth plane, and it's it's great business to have them on there. We had the same amount of broadcast hours for the Women's Open uh, golf this year as we did the Men's Open, and that was the first time that happened. Uh, heading into the Summer Olympics, quite honestly, our marketing campaign is all about women's sports. Simone Biles, Kate Ledecky. Sydney McLaughlin, uh, Shakari Richardson. I mean, those four will headline our entire marketing campaign for the Paris Olympics. And it's hard to actually find men to promote uh, outside the NBA players and the men's basketball team. Um, but we, we, it's a priority and it comes up in every conversation. Great. And since becoming the uh, president of NBC Sports, it feels weird been... to even hear you say that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> But it's amazing. I'm waiting for someone to tap me on the throat that we made a huge mistake. <laughs> but no, they've made a great, great trick. Um, have you taken on any other roles? Since, uh, yeah, I was it? running programming before, and programming is hey, what are the rights we're going to acquire? What are the rights we're going to put on air? How do we manage the partnerships you have with the various leagues that we have contracts with? Uh, the new job has a little bit more on the production side. So dealing with on-air talent, and I knew on-air talent, but you know now I'm in the great depths of the on-air talent. They all want to have breakfast and lunch and any meal. I could probably you know figure out my my game plan for the next six months. Um, that's a different element of it all, and making changes and what I think is right and how we're viewed on air is, is something that I didn't have a say in before, and, and now I, I do. Uh, so we'll 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 get through that, and that's kind of different. The other things it seems like a lot of decisions fall to your desk. Um, we have a water pressure issue. That apparently it's going to cost five hundred thousand dollars to fix, and we're nervous about you know having two thousand employees at our office during the Paris Olympics, and somehow I have to make a decision on whether it's been five hundred thousand dollars of capital to fix the water pressure that may or may not be an issue. Uh, we have a, reef, a leaky roof that's happening too that we need to take care of. So it's just like random things that come around as you sort of move up. They they find your way to your desk. Very good, um, Sarah. I. Uh... I mentioned I'm a strong advocate for student athletes, but I'm also a very strong advocate for women in sports. Um, I think women make great leaders, uh, especially in the sports industry. What challenges have you seen um, getting into your role and while being in it? Um, I feel like I've seen, I'm at that age where I've seen like a whole evolution, you know, of, um, what it means to be a woman in sports if i'm being completely honest it's much different now than it was um when i was first starting out um when i first started out i was assistant and but then um i was very fortunate to work for someone like larry because his architect was a, a woman his lawyer was a woman and so he was a big believer in putting i think strong-headed women into places where he needed people to sort of run through a brick wall because he was like, they want to really prove themselves. And I think that worked to my advantage back in the day when I was in San Diego. Um, I think um, there's just been so many changes. It's hard to explain. There's more women's sports on TV. There's more women in front of the camera. Um, there's women sitting at the desk as opposed to the sideline. Um, my own daughter is a woman, a female athlete. She just graduated from college. Um, and the opportunities afforded to her, just everything from getting the same, she was out at Cal Berkeley and getting the same amount of like gear as the male athletes might like back in the day, that might not have been the case. And, and so I see strides in so many different ways, but in a lot of ways, um, I think the most remarkable thing is, is that because so many more women are in the workforce now, in my opinion, and I think that's largely due to 
just the cost of living, right? There's, it's not as common anymore to have a, a household where one parent works and the other parent stays at home statistically. And so I see a lot more men that I work with taking a much more active role in their children's lives or in the household duties. And that's the evolution I've seen from my male counterparts um, as we grow and mature and, and do all these other things. When I was first starting out, it was not like that. It was someone else was handling the family and the men were working. Now, um, my counterparts, they're much more involved. And I think that's a fantastic thing. And the way that I think women can be a real asset to that is that um, because they have had to juggle that role for longer, if you were a woman in the workforce, they are that much more skilled at as, as you get to the executive level. And they're much more comfortable giving their male employees even the bandwidth and the support needed to be a good parent and survive and thrive as an employee and become a leader. They've had to navigate those waters sometimes a little bit more than some of my male counterparts have. So that's one evolution I would say that I've seen. Back when I was uh, at PC, there was a soft-spoken uh, female student named Doris Sable at that time who um, went on to become Doris Burke, who's mm -hmm. probably the most powerful voice um, in NBA sports out there. Um, can you think of anything back at PC that you carried forward with you? Um, I remember getting into some academic trouble once. Um, <laughs> probably the best way to put it. Um, and I mean to put you on a spot. No, 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 no. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you that I was like this amazing student. Um, and I remember being very, very upset about it. And, and, and I felt like in this particular situation mm -hmm. that the professor was wrong. And um, I ended up going to, um, I don't, I can't remember his name right now, but you know, one of the deans who was um, a member of the clergy and he just said to me, he's, we talked a lot about stoicism and we talked a lot about, is this the right time for you to object this way? Do you have the right to object this way right now? Should you look internally amongst yourself? Should you just wait and then maybe later bring this up? And there was a real life lesson there that I think that could be applied to business about um, just picking and choosing your moments. Because while I agree that you have to really be out there sometimes and I am most comfortable professionally like right on the edge, that is where I like to be of progressive, but not like too far that I put itself us up a cliff. Um, but I think taking risks, but I think also knowing, you know, when to be restrained is also a life skill that's important because you can't in business, regardless of who you are, um, fly off the handle. It just doesn't usually end well. Rick, what are your thoughts on women in sports? Do you um, pay close attention to that? I would imagine you do. Yeah, I mentioned that you know that what we have on air before, but you know my senior staff, there, I think there's maybe thirty percent are women. And I'm the dad of four girls, so I, I hope that you know <laughs> women have every single opportunity a man has in this world. And uh, I know that we spend a lot of time again from hiring practice to make sure that we have a diverse workforce across the board, but. No, I, I mean, there's there's no difference. And I think in many respects with where the sports are going and covering women's sports, we'll see more more women in, in our industry. Great. You played on a great PC uh, basketball team. Um, you guys had a, a hell of a run. Uh, great, great teammates you had, too, as well. Just uh, not only great players, but a lot of great humans that you had on your team with Austin and Ruben Garces. Um I mentioned to you earlier how uh, Corey Wright, his son, is in my class now. Um, Sham God was on that team. Share with, share with us uh, your experience during that time period and uh, what was your most favorable, memorable moment? It was a wild run. Um, you know, we were a good team. 
you know, maybe a little bit not always in sync. Uh, heading into the Big East tournament, we had to win a game in the Big East tournament to get into the NCAA tournament. The year prior, we were on the on the bubble and the bubble burst, and we didn't make it. Um, so this is 1997, and uh, I think beat West Virginia in the Big East tournament, which we felt like we were pretty comfortably in. And I think there's some food poisoning. We lost to Villanova in the finals. I remember all this like of yesterday too. <laughs> it goes to show, you know, what an impact it had on me. Um, but we go and play Marquette in the first round, and uh, we were a 10 seed. They were a 7 seed. They just won Conference USA, and uh, we beat them by 25. Austin hit a 75-foot shot at the end of the halftime buzzer. Um, Pete Gillen grabbing goes, all right, I'm going to put you in the game, but don't blow it. I'm like, Coach, we're up by 25 points with a minute left. If I can blow that kind of lead, then there's sort of like, you know, divine intervention happening that is going to, you know, lead us to a loss. But he put me in the game, and it was a it was a magical moment. Like, I'd never had any ambition that I'm some star basketball player. I would, felt like I was on fantasy camp being on the team and being able to travel the, the country and, you know, be at these big events and see the star players that would later go on to be in the NBA and some like Allen Iverson and Ray Allen would be in the Hall of Fame. But we beat Marquette in the first round. Then we played Duke in the second round, who was a two seed. They had uh, Wojo and Langdon and Rashad McLeod and all these McDonald's All-Americans. And Pete Gillen had a great quote saying, we have a lot in common with Duke. They have five McDonald's all America. We like to eat at McDonald's. <laughs> so it was a it was a great sort of like setting. We were a 10 seed and we were good when we came together. Uh, we beat them. I think it was maybe by 10 or 12 down in Charlotte, which was not a neutral court by any stretch, but we beat them down in Charlotte. And then all of a sudden Nike started airlifting gear into our locker room. And you know, we felt like the big time we started flying charters to, to Alabama where we played Tennessee Chattanooga. And the next, next round, time, Tennessee Chattanooga had upset Illinois and Georgia. Georgia. We knocked off Tennessee Chattanooga, but the earlier game was Kansas. It was 32-1 and one with Jacques Vaughn, Paul Pierce, Scott Pollard, like complete studs, and na- number one team in the country, and Arizona beat them. And we're like, well, I don't know if we could have beat Kansas, but Arizona, maybe. And so we played Arizona to go to the final four. Um, the final game of the Sunday, Jim Packer um, and, uh, and, and, and Nance were on the call. And it was just, it was, it felt like this is the big time. The place was electric. Uh, we were down by 12. They fouled Austin Crozier out with like 10 minutes left on some, you know, some bad call. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, Sham God put the team on his back and brought us back. And uh, Jamel Thomas had a three pointer from the corner with maybe 20 something seconds left to tie the game up. We stole the ball at midcourt. Sham God, instead of driving to the hoop, took an elbow jumper, missed it, ball bat around, Providence ball under the Arizona hoop with 3.9 seconds on the clock. And uh, the play was slow to develop. When we uh, we called timeout, we had a slow developing play, and Derek Brown came off a screen on the bottom baseline, and one more second could have maybe fed him down low for the game winner. And the people with the hats and the jerseys got behind our bench and were like, look at them. We hit a game-winning shot. We're going to be putting this up and taking down the nets. And, uh, it wasn't to be, and we end up losing in overtime. But it was a magical just run overall. And I remember getting back to campus after the Duke win, and we could not get off the bus. The students like kind of just packed it all. We're like, what are we going to do? How are we going to get out of here? And it was just a magical time at Providence College that I remember so vividly. Uh, I guess it was two or three weeks that we had that run. But it was just it's etched in stone. And I think a lot of it is just – Again, it's on the other side of it now and kind of covering big time athletics. I can think back of that. And whenever someone mentions me, that kind of goes along with my bio, I guess. But it was just a, a fantastic time, a great team that gelled at the right moment and just like this close to, to get into the final four. Yeah, that was that was a great squad to say the least. Um talk a little bit about the uh the big east, um, which in the beginning I mentioned the greatness of Providence College being involved in the sports industry, arguably the uh, Big East Conference would not be the Big East Conference, but for Providence College, we had a lot of Friar family at the table. There was uh, Dave Gavin, Mike Trangisi, um, and on and on. Dave Duffy, uh, who wasn't an athlete, but was very instrumental in the Big East Conference being formed. What are your thoughts on the Big East Conference? I mean, Providence would be Holy Cross without it, right? I mean, it's a, it's a moment where you brought all these big-time schools that prioritize basketball in the East Coast cities that made, you know, Providence College, I think in many respects what it is. I mean, the identity of Providence College, again, I'm biased, I'm a basketball player, but the identity is when you look at that game against, you know, Columbia the other night or Milwaukee on, on you know, Saturday, I mean, that that is the pride of the school. That's what's on national TV every week. 
And if you're not part of that, again, you're Holy Cross, which there's nothing wrong with Holy Cross. Holy Cross is a great school, but there's no, they don't have, you know, 13,000 season tickets to go to, you know, the Heart Center and, and at Holy Cross. So, the uh, George Club, by the way, but we, we well, there's well, some shot, there's some shot, there's some shot really there, but, um, it, I mean, it, but it's true. I mean, it sort of, it helps, you know, again, a reason why I probably came to Providence and I had no idea of getting the basketball team is like, I get to go to, you know, see basketball games. That's going to be a fun time. And I, I think that's part of what, you know, there's a culture of the school that's spread through the school. And it's just a cool thing that, you know, uniquely, you know, PC has. And the Big East is great. I mean, the Big East, my freshman year, it was a lottery, lottery pick on the other team. When I mentioned Allen Iverson, Ray Allen, Kerry Kittles. Uh, Ron Sheffer at, at UConn, um, Jason Lawson. Like, you just had NBA guys, Othell like Harrington, like, NBA guys through and through. And it was the – and I remember Pete Gillen, like, this is the best league outside the NBA. And it's true. The Big East was the best basketball league in the world outside the NBA. And the reincarnation of it now with what has happened, I mean, it deserved, you know, all the folks that were involved in sort of taking what, what football was kind of stealing away and causing a harm to the basketball league. You know, to recreate it, to add the schools that we've added with Creighton, Xavier, um, Nepal, maybe. Um, but adding a lot of schools that have contributed now to this new league that is like a top basketball league. No one is questioning whether Big East belongs next to the Big Ten or the SEC or the ACC. It absolutely belongs there athletically. And I think, it, you know, I'm really proud of, of, of the Big East and where it is today. How do uh, individuals within your industry talk about Providence College when you hear them mention Robert Collins, what do they say? I mean, basketball comes up. I mean, that's, you know, down in the sports world, the basketball team comes up and, you know, our success. But also in terms of just the involvement in the sports industry in general. Yeah, I mean, there's Rich Gotham who runs the Celtics. I uh, was with him last week. Uh, as you mentioned, Doris Burke before, so there's certain alumni that pop up there. But I think, you know, it's well-respected across the sports industry. I mean, great athletes. I know national championships with the hockey uh, in 2015 or so. And we you know, obviously cross country we win a lot. Uh, the soccer team went far. I mean, it definitely pops up there and it's definitely on, it's relevant for within the sports industry. Do you have any PC uh, grads that are any, as talent on NBC Sports? Yeah, Eileen Sokol, who played volleyball here at Providence, a couple of years older than me. Um, she runs our digital business as well as our business development. Um, so she's on the, the Providence team. There's a few other, you know, younger folks that on Providence are in the NBC Sports team as well in the finance team. Very good. And how do you hear uh, Providence College spoken of? Um, I hear about it a lot, like as it pertains to basketball socially, right? Like people do love love the basketball, and we do have a fair amount of Providence College grads at not only our company, but you know, I work a lot with some of other companies. We have. Um, Started a golf team with um they're gonna broadcast us right sure yep. this is what yes. <laughs> um so we just started a golf team and then we also have the penguins and we have liverpool football and some other entities and we have pc grads all around um but i think throughout sports just beyond providence and i think it's the importance of recognizing alumni networks and things like that um there are strong alumni networks, you know, everywhere. I'm living in a Trinity College alumni network right now. The heads of three of our companies are all all Trinity people. Um, but um, it's it is important that when you think about those sorts of things, just to, to sort of make those connections. So as we talk to the young people and impress upon them. Um, to look up those sorts of things because it is real and you can make connections, whether it's at a basketball game or something like this. Um, you know, I, I remember reading once someone talking about how sports is the front front porch of philanthropy for, for a college or a university, but it's also where the community goes back and gathers um, in my experience. So I do think it's important to look to and maintain those alumni connections. And I know we talk about PC basketball a lot, but all the other sports are great too as well. I mean, men's hockey plays at, uh, at Fenway. Um, yeah, my husband played hockey at Union College. And so your hockey coach, um, we knew him back when he was at Union. Um, so because he's involved with his alumni alumni group there, Nate was a coach there beforehand. So um, I know that that's a big deal when PC hockey comes and plays, plays at Fenway. Um, They've done it I think, once or twice now. I can't remember. 
Uh, but it's always a good time. Yeah. And Mintaki has a national championship, which the basketball does not yet have. But <laughs> how do you feel about that, Rick? I mean, it's, I mean, look, it, BC wins no matter what sport. It's great for the college. Right. It's great for everything. You know, and I, again, I hope basketball can, can add to the cabinet at some point. And what are your thoughts on the, what a difference it makes to have a healthy athletic program at a college or a university? Just on the mind, people know, again, in New England, I, I work in New York City a lot. Like, there are a lot of people like Providence College, like, oh, I remember God Sham died. Or I remember, you know, you know, they're ranked in the top 25 this week. They're on, you know, Fox Sports or Fox, you know, uh, broadcast. Like, that just helps the identity of our school. And I know and you're taking it from a regionalized school that's in New England to like a school when you get on the big stage and play an NCAA tournament. What is some some advice you would give the PC students as they embark on their careers? Any helpful hints? First, me. <laughs> I, I mean, again, I, I look at my own career path. I mentioned taking risk, but you know, don't get frustrated. It doesn't all happen overnight. I see a lot of. I don't want to put everyone in a and again a one class, but it takes time. You know, it takes time to go up, and your career is not going to be a great linear line. Like, start at your level, two years in, your next level, you're going to be here, vice president, senior vice president, executive vice president, president. It doesn't happen that way. It goes up and down, and you're not going to get a job you want to get or felt you should get. You're going to feel like you want to leave the company, and you got to make these tougher choices. But uh, just be resilient. Work your tail off. Um, make sure you, you take the appropriate risk with your career. Uh, be subject matter experts treat people really well both on the way up and on the way down like saying thank you and working at relationships is really important one of the things that dick everthal always told me i gotta go relationships drive business and just like any relationship you have to work at it you have to reach out to people have coffee have lunch reach out how are you doing hey i heard this about you are you doing okay what can i do to help you like all that stuff and again it's not a transaction you're having with someone but like you're speaking of human beings but you have to really take the time to be that. And I, again, I, I, I look back at like, hey, how did I get to where I am? A lot of that, I, just, I think I treat people well, or I try to. Um, and that's just a big part of your career arc. It's, it's like, are you someone that people want to work with? Are you someone that one people want to work for? Are they going to work their, their tail off for you when you ask them to do something? Are they going to go out of their way on a weekend because sports are happening on the weekend to sort of solve a problem with you? Or are they going to say, I'll see you Monday morning? So all that stuff takes it takes a little toll, and it, it sort of adds up over time to help you be in the position to sort of be elevated when the right time comes. Sure. Um, I would say a lot of the same things. I mean, I think um, when you go out into the working world, especially when you're you're young, I think you should take risks. I think you should look for a big adventure. I think you should try different places to live. I think you should try different. Um, types of companies to work for that might be out of your comfort zone. Um, but you also have to work hard. Um, everybody appreciates people that show up and they work hard. And um, it's okay to say, I don't know, so long as you follow it up with, but I'll find out. Um, it's okay to um, make mistakes um, and just get back up again and try again and try again and, and go from there. Um, I have a lot of ambitious young people that work for me, um, a lot of young people, and they always just seem to be in such a rush too. And they're like, well, I haven't done this yet. I haven't done that yet. I haven't done this yet. And I haven't done that. And I always just have to say, you know, it's not a race. You know, when we all die, we don't get to heaven. And they're like, oh, you did this. So you get to go first. Like, it just doesn't work out that way. So you have to be happy in what you're doing as well. And you have to be pretty comfortable with yourself um, to figure out what your priorities are. Because just like you say, oh, in the next 10 years, I'm going to do this. In the next 15 years, I'm going to do this. In the next 20 years, I'm going to do this. Something's going to derail that. You might fall in love. You might um, have a child. You might have a sick parent. You know, you have to be prepared to be flexible. Um, and you have to be an active participant in your professional growth. Because you can do it all, but you can't do it all in one day. It just can't happen. You can have it all, just not all the same day. And so I think if you um, just wake up every day and say, I'm just going to do my best, and whether it's taking risks or outworking someone else, 
so that you are always thought of to get that promotion or to get that new opportunity. Um, those were all great things to have. So in, in great skills and assets, because the world is changing so much. I mean, I'm, sh you know, when I was here, they were just starting to get email. When you were just starting to code, like we weren't even thinking of streaming, right? Like we were watching Nesson and McVinney, like that was, you know, but through the cable, but that's really what it was. Um, the world that we're living in right now, we wouldn't survive in it if we weren't willing to adapt. And if we weren't willing to say, I'll try that new thing, or I believe in that new technology. But along with that, you have to believe in the next young person that comes along that might know a little bit more about something than you do, so. Both great words of wisdom. Um, I'd love to get both of your thoughts on the transition of PC campus, how every time we come back, it seems like it's, um, well, I'm here often now, but coming back, it's always different. Uh, certainly it was different from back when I was here. I mean, that was all a parking lot down, down below Joe's. I lived in Joe's my freshman year, but then after that, I lived off campus, but Everything beyond that was just door, uh, fennel, which is where the, a lot of the basketball players live. Um, what are your thoughts, Rick, on the transition? The skyline has changed, for sure, yeah. of, uh, of Providence College. And uh, I get a nice score of the athletic uh, facility today by That's crazy, right now. And um, yeah. we had a dungeon of a weight room that, you know, you had to, like, you know, worry about elbowing someone out of the way to lift weights. You might drop a dumbbell on someone's foot. And. It's amazing the facilities that exist there. And you walk around the business building, you walk around the campus, and it's just, you are so incredible. I'm not trying to say we lived like in a different life, like, hey, the 1950s, it snowed every day, and we walked up hills to wait school. But it feels that way to a degree. I feel like an old man being like, it's amazing, like, how great this campus is, how great it is. The facilities you all have, both academically and athletically, are just blow me away and i've been on a bunch of tours and my daughters they're looking at schools and pc and right at the very top of place. like it's just an absolutely incredible place that this place has been and you know where it's where it's going what dorm were you in i was in guzman freshman year okay yeah the trip triple where we, i think we just all squished in there i don't know if they had too many people at, at you know at roll or whatever and then that's in mar hall uh sophomore year and your thoughts on the um, when we drove here tonight, I don't come back to sorry c campus all too often. Yeah. But um, my friend Kristen's here. She joined me today because we she lives in the area. We graduated together, so we went to have dinner beforehand. Um, but she, she was like, "We'll just drive through the McVinney Gate," and I was like, "Wait a minute, you can drive not McVinney. That is that the gate with the gate? Yeah. What is the Harkins Gate? I was like, she's yeah. like, I was like, you can drive through that gate now. Like, I didn't even know that because it used to be that you just right. Not, no, no, you to there was go. nothing to the right or to the left, and you certainly they used to not open that gate for you. I don't know who was allowed to get through that gate, but it certainly certainly wasn't anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, just those little things in itself. But I had come back over the years when you know my kids had played hockey games at the rink, and um, and just to see the evolution of the fields and and things like that it's um it's remarkable even the houses that live that are outside I, I lived on Eaton and you lived on Pembroke and friends that lived on Oakland and all the like they look so much they're so much nicer with them <laughs> than what we lived in um but just there's a lot of things that have changed yeah we've upgraded we no, we had the yoke truck back there. Yeah, the it was right Turkey, turkey bacon, Swiss. <laughs> 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 it's particularly good. Yeah, I mean, cheese sandwich. Yes. It, 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 that was the best. It was. It was really, really good. Yes. <laughs> really good. <laughs> Can't tell too many secrets. Um, how are we on time? Who am I looking for? Do I got some more time? Uh, two minutes. All right. Should we get some questions from the students, per se, or...? Always hard for the first question to go, and then it's uh, right. Are any of my students in here? Okay. Yeah, I see. All right, here we go. <laughs> you have a question? Me? Yeah. Um, what was probably your hardest challenge day to day, like working in NBC Sports? What? How did you overcome that? This challenge every day. I mean, there's always a challenge every day. I mean, it's managing people is hard. Um, you know, and, and it's managing their, you know, 
their careers, their functional, their careers, and their ambition. I think that's difficult, and sometimes you tell them things they don't want to hear, and how do you do that? You keep them motivated because you don't want to leave the company. Uh, that's really hard. Um, you know, losing property is hard in NBC Sports. We have never lose property. It, it costs jobs. Um, so that weighs a little bit on me. And then when we're sending people overseas for, you know, bigger sport, we're going to Paris. You know, 1,200 people are traveling to Paris. How do we keep them safe in this world? That's, you know, seemingly kind of hard. Uh, how do we make sure that they can get their work done appropriately? Um, how do we make sure that they are productive there? How do we get them all home safely? Um, or expanded upon your question, but th those are all things that sort of weigh on me. What do both of you see as the future of sports, the sports industry? What do you think is on the horizon? Anything new or oh, you throw that or log in the fire and <laughs> another hour? No, it's uh. <laughs> I, and like, look, I think there is a. Or from a career, um, for the students who may be thinking of a career in sports, to not necessarily know exactly what, but there might be something new and different coming about. So we start and say, 30,000 of you, people love sports. They love watching sports in great numbers. They care about their sports. They're passionate, irrationally for their sports teams. And as long as that happens, the sports industry and business is going to be super healthy. I think that has not changed whatsoever. How we consume sports is changing. You know, we can we can still have 27.5 million people show for the NFL opener on NBC Sports, but 10% of that was on Peacock this year, a record high. I think the highest we had the previous year was 6%. So you're seeing a shift of consumption happening more quickly than maybe we even anticipated. So what is the mechanism that we're going to have for you to consume sports? How do we do it differently? How do we program and do production differently. We have we had a baseball series that probably annoyed you at some point. We had a start time 11.30 at Fenway Park. And so thinking about windowing differently, I had this crazy idea that we need to put sports coming out of Sunday Night Football because the West Coast has a local news and repeat dateline episodes. And how do we sort of think about differently in programming things? What sports matter? You know, Premier Lacrosse League is one that went to ESPN. That has seemingly grown out of nowhere. The UFC grew out of nowhere. 10 years ago, what are the sports that will happen? I've been pitched pickleball more than probably 500 times. I'm not sure pickleball is the future of the sports, uh, but it's certainly out there. So I, all that sort of plays in. How does gambling and betting play in? You know, how much is too much? How much do we have a moral obligation not to have people hooked in losing their money that they can't afford to lose? So all that stuff is all kind of where I'm, I'm thinking about. Is there anything? Um. I think about it in a lot of the same ways. Like it's always going to be healthy because I think just at its core and I'm a little different. He wants to get people. I, I worry about getting people to tune in on certain different things with our property Nesson. But for the most part, um, I worry about making sure that the live event itself is, has the atmosphere and has the intensity and has the sense of community that makes people want to come back and come back and makes it feel as if it's part of their birthright, right? Like that, that is that they are born into this community and, or that they can be brought into this community when they go to college or something like that um, in the Boston and the new England area. So that that experience touches them so much that it never leaves them. Um, but I also worry. Um, I think gambling is a great, great example there's going to be ways that that impacts us um, in in real meaningful ways because if a pitch is thrown but he's got it on a six second delay or a five second delay, technology moves much faster than that. So someone can send a text message to someone sitting at a um, casino if you've got you're you're gambling down to the pitch or down to the strike or you know if someone's sitting in a chair and just pushing a button that says. $50 on a strike, $50 on a ball, whatever it is. Um, so how that would work, what the labor of that is, and how the television event, you know, has to come much closer for something like that to exist for a live event and how gambling impacts all of us, I think is sort of the next big frontier. You know, when you go over and you go to the EPL or you go to some of the leagues in Europe, it's much more part of their culture there to place bets and do things like that on, on teams. And I'm interested to sort of see where that goes and how America responds to it. Because morally, I agree, there's, there's some real risks there. If we look to children and we want to get them involved in sports, but 
I know it's hard for me when I even drive my son to school and he's 15 years old and I find myself turning off sports radio because they are talking about betting so much. What about from an ethical standpoint, what would you like to see cleaned up somewhat in sports? I mean, I mean, a lot of that stuff ends up with the teams and the leagues. I like to sort of separate out some of the ethics, though I know it's difficult. We have concussions in the NFL, mm-hmm. and how do we feel about that? Um, that's somehow gotten past it, even though probably it hasn't really changed all that much. You mentioned gambling before. Um, you get into a little bit of, you know, I don't know if it's ethics of playing players and collegiate athletics. How did that kind of manifest itself all the way down? Um, how do you cover athletes that aren't great human beings? And we shouldn't necessarily build them up to be something that they're not. And so we, we try and tell the stories, but how do you tell a full story? Oftentimes, um, even even things with, you know, the Olympics are always in places which tend to not be the greatest place in the world, whether it be Brazil or we're in Sochi, Russia. How do you mention some of the atrocities that happen in these countries? We're in Beijing for the Winter Olympics. You know, human rights in, in China isn't a great topic and so how do you cover the sport and not turn people off but also not ignore what i think you have a moral obligation to report on um so we've tried to take a balance and bring our news division along with us so they can report on some of those uh you know atrocities that happen with the news and we try and say we're covering the game but it's not always easy to separate the two no i would just agree it's i mean we have to remember that everybody that's playing the sport comes from a member of our society and we continue to live in an imperfect society you know we're all human you know we have intellect we have free will we have all those sorts of things and pe- a lot of people wake up every single day and make good choices and then every so often every single one of us makes a bad choice and so covering the individual but i think and you know what that means and when you're in a country particularly with the olympics it's got to be so challenging but i also think um there's so many things that you can talk about when it comes to these things. Um, There's so many examples that come up of just as much as you can think about someone being great. Someone's mistakes, unfortunately, sometimes played out in public, start some really interesting conversations too about um, just, you know, from a social perspective. And so I never want to make it so perfect and um, so pristine and so ethical that it's, that it's not human. Right. And on that note, what does sports mean to you outside of the uh, playing field, outside of the arena? What does sports mean to you in general? Um, I think for me, um, it just is the prism through which I see a lot of things in life. And um, it's, for me, it's about a sense of community. It's about a sense of belonging. Um, it's about being part of something that's greater than yourself. I mean, sports and society, it, it feels like, and we like to say it's one thing that brings us all together. Society is so polarized now in the political spectrum, but you see people getting together and cheering on the Patriots, cheering on the Friars. You can have a different view than I have, but we're going to get there in the camp and, and cheer for the Friars versus Wisconsin tomorrow night. So it does, and we feel like the Olympics is also a little bit of bringing America together. And so we're trying to use sport as a means of society of, you know, getting people to get along. Um, and you look at where society is. I mean, 95 of the top 100 shows last year were sports. Um, and so you see it I take a greater importance overall of us all being in the same room together uh, to a degree. Great, great. Keep going? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wrap it up? Is that just us? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you didn't play sports, did you? <laughs> I don't know if that was a wrap up sign. Um, well, let's. Uh, I, I think we've had a, a some great words of wisdom from Rick and Sarah. Uh, let's give them a, a great round of applause. And we and we applaud all of you too as well for joining us. It's important that you take that these type of steps to be involved, to be engaged. It's extremely important.